What's going on guys? It's Jesse Stokes here back with another video. We're going to be moving along right where we're at in the Bible and we're going to be going from chapter through chapter. Today we are in chapter 56 and if you've been with us for some time, we've been in the book of Isaiah going through chapter 53 talking about the world's most famous prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 54, we learned about the eternal covenant of peace that God wants to have with Israel. In chapter 55, we talked about the power of the Word of God for us practically. And now we come into chapter 56. Chapter 56 is a good chapter. Um, the book of Isaiah can be broken up simply into two different sections. And it's helpful to sometimes break up things and put them in a simple way for us to understand. So a simple way to try to navigate your way through the book of Isaiah is to go from chapters 1 through 40 as the first section symbolizing the Old Testament and chapters 40 through 66 as the second section symbolizing the New Testament. It's the very same way that the Bible was written in chapters 1 through 40, or books 1 through 40 is the Old Testament, and books 40 through 66, starting in Matthew to Revelation, is the New Testament. So they actually saw this connection with the book of Isaiah, and scholars and, and, and studiers of uh, the Bible have called it the mini Bible because it's a 66 chapter book in a 66 book of the Bible. So we're in chapter 56 and chapter 56 can be broken down in a simple way. Um, verses 1 through 5 talk about the mystery of the tree. Verses 6 through 8 talk about the mystery of church history. And chapter or verses 9 and 12 talk about the mystery of the rapture. So 1 through 5, the mystery of the tree. 6 through 8, the mystery of the church. And 9 through 12, the mystery of the rapture. So before we get into it, we're going to read Isaiah 28, 8 and 9, as we always do, to keep us grounded in this simple truth. It says this, To whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And we see from that scripture that God's saying, I want to give you knowledge. and I want you to read through verse by verse through the scriptures. Now, whether that means systematically from Genesis to Revelation, or however the Lord leads you to be in your Bible, he wants you to read verse through verse. And that's how we really start to understand the Lord. You know, I actually looked up on the internet um, some fun these are the top 10 craziest animal facts one of the animal facts was from this website called wildlife.com and it was published just last year the title of this mini article was that a snail race was banished because the snails were too sluggish the snail race was postponed because the snails were too, and it's in quotations, it says sluggish. And it says this, the, the writer says this, competition organizers from the Dartmoor Union Pub in Plymouth were sadly wet, let down when they went to a pet shop to collect their racing snails. They were told that they were extra sleepy and therefore not fit to race. And then it says, happily, there were no such problems at the world snail race in the coming July. You see, there were snails ready to race, <laughs> and they actually postponed the race 
because they, the snails weren't going fast enough. And snails already are super slow. And I can't believe people even watch snail races. Like we don't do that in America. I feel like that's just kind of weird. I don't think I would really want to watch that, but I guess people are into it. But they postponed the race because the snails were just sluggish, not really moving along, just kind of inching over because they were too sleepy. You see, and, and that's the sad thing that can even happen to Christians today. You know, we could be just moving along so slowly, never really taking that next step, not going forward, and just like a snail being sluggish and empty, and no one likes that. You don't like it, other people don't like it, and the Bible says that if you go and you, and you take the scriptures verse by verse, then you will get understanding. Paul says in Philippians that I will run the race of faith, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forth to what lies ahead. So let us pray and then we're going to go into Isaiah chapter 56. Father, I pray that you would teach us your word personally. Lord, you would show us exactly what you want to say. God, we would not waver or falter from the discipline of knowing you. Father, teach us to know you, not to go in works, board, but to rest in grace and just to operate out of the abundance and overflow of your love for us. And God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, open up our eyes. Holy Spirit power, come. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 says this. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come, oh, it's, and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. God here is saying to you and I today that my salvation, my deliverance, my redemption, heaven is coming soon. So keep going, Jesse. Keep taking that next step. Keep following me. Keep serving me. Don't quit because my salvation will come soon and my righteousness will be revealed. You see, God loves us, but he also wants to keep us on our toes because that's when we operate the best. You know, when I was younger, I really loved video games. I was totally into them. I spent most of my time obsessing about them. And if I wasn't playing them, I was watching a YouTube video about someone else playing that video game. But one of my favorite games was NBA, basketball. It was called 2K and they would have different years, 2K15, 2K16. And when I was about 17 years old, there was something I wanted really bad. Christmas is coming up, and I actually put NBA 2K coming out on Christmas at the very top of my list. And I knew I didn't believe in Santa Claus, and I knew that my parents and my grandparents would get it for me. But I wanted it so bad, I couldn't wait for the gift. So I all of a sudden became super obedient, super thankful, super loving, in hopes that I knew that NBA 2K17 with the new characters, the new updates, the new teams with LeBron James, I could use him. And I knew that it was coming soon, so I started to purify the way I lived. 
You see, that's exactly the way that Jesus Christ wants us to live our lives. The book of 1 John tells us, in 1 John chapter 3, he says, He who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. When you're looking at Jesus, when you're waiting for him, when you know he's coming soon, it has a natural purification to our lives, a natural cleansing of things that I wouldn't have done otherwise if I didn't think he was coming soon. You see, God wants us to get our eyes off of this world and think about heaven. He says, my righteousness will be revealed. It's important to define what righteousness is. Righteousness means completely, fully right with God. You see, Christians are fully right with God when they believe and receive Christ in their hearts. When they repent of their sins and believe that Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again, God puts the gavel down on his judgment and says, you're free to go, Jesse. I don't see your sin anymore. You're declared righteous. But God's saying it's going to be revealed soon for us in heaven. We're going to fully understand what righteousness is. And until then, we want to know more and more about it and live out of that. Then it says this, blessed is the man who does this. Notice it doesn't say blessed is the man who hears this. Blessed is the man who teaches this doctrine. Blessed is the man who does this, who lives it, who lives in expectation that God is coming soon. You see, the psalmist says, David writes in Psalm 119, Blessed is the man who walks, or no, sorry, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to the word of God. Our purity does not come by just listening to the word or teaching about the word, but it comes with obeying and following and taking heed according to it. So it says, blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast. Then it says this, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Now, the Sabbath is mentioned a little bit later in verse six. So we're going to, to pause there. And when we get to verse six, we're going to talk more about the Sabbath because it's, it's a question that we need to have answered. Then it says this, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, and who holds fast to my covenant. I will give in my house within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. They shall not be cut off. So God here is saying that the foreigner, listen, this is huge. The foreigner. So Isaiah was writing specifically to the Jews to the nation of Israel. And now he's talking, we have to make the distinction, he's talking about the foreigner. Now the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord. So that implies that one day, other people can join themselves to the Lord that are not Jewish people. Speaking of the Christian who is joined to the Lord and even not if they're Jewish. So the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord and let not the eunuch say, the eunuch is someone that is not Jewish. That's another place. That's one of the kingly positions. Behold, I am a dry tree. So this is talking about 
I said in the beginning, verses 1 through 5 really are talking about the mystery of the tree. So to understand this confusion, this mystery, Paul in Romans 9 through 11 explains simply and expounds upon Israel specifically. So open up to Romans 9 through 11. And in chapter t chapter 11, verses 11 through 23, talk about this mystery of the tree. Now I want to explain this through an example, and I hope this, this helps. Okay. So this is basically a very simple version of what God's talking about. This is called the mystery of the tree. And this is huge to understand. So there's a tree. Can you see the tree? This tree represents the nation Israel. God planted this vineyard specifically. And these pieces of the tree connected to the roots are Israel. You see, but then Jesus came to fulfill the things of, of God, but the Jewish people did not believe. They hardened their hearts. So Romans says that the branches were, he uses the word, cut off. He says they were broken off. Some of the branches were broken off. So now these branches are falling off. They're dying. You see how they're all kind of falling off? Now the tree is empty and there's no one who's connected to God. All the branches are dry. But then it says that God is going to graft in or insert in or put in another group of people. And he calls them the wild branches. Um, here we have a wild branch. You see how there's leaves connected? This is symbolism of the wild branch. Now the wild branch is teaching us, Paul is teaching us that these are not necessarily Jewish people. This is a Christian. This is someone from Africa. This is someone from China. Whoever believes in the name of Jesus shall be saved. So now the tree is filled up with wild leaves because Israel has been cut off and the branch was refilled with anyone who believes in Jesus. And so Paul here is saying that the, the branch or the tree is a representative of the nation Israel being cut off for a moment and refilled up with the Christian. So he's saying, let not the foreigner say, surely the Lord will separate me from his people. Now all of the promises of Israel can be taken and it says that in Corinthians that they're yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So that's the mystery of the tree. Then now it's talking about the mystery, verses 6 through 8, of the church. It says this, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, who holds fast my covenant. So here in verse 6 and in verse 2, we see that God is telling us, commanding us, requiring a blessing to us if we keep his Sabbath. Now, I don't have time to dive in too deeply to the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was when God rested from his works on the seventh day. God created the world, and on the seventh day, he rested from his works as a symbolism to the Jewish nation that they were literally supposed to stop everything they were doing on Saturday, specifically, 
and to make that day holy to the Lord. It was one of the Ten Commandments, and they were required to follow it. But the Sabbath, after Jesus came, is no longer binding on us, but it's more of now a privilege for us. So Hebrews 3 and 4 talk about the Sabbath principle spiritually. So the Sabbath today can be taken in two parts. One, the spiritual Sabbath. Believing and resting in Jesus Christ is called the Sabbath rest in Hebrews 4. Resting from trying to earn God's favor and resting in that Jesus said it is finished is us entering into the Sabbath. So we are keeping the Sabbath if we're resting in the finished work of Jesus, not depending on ourselves, not striving to earn God's favor. That is the spiritual Sabbath. But then practically, the Sabbath is something that should be obeyed by a Christian. But nonetheless, it is not binding on the Christian. Romans 7 makes it very clear. We are completely set free from every law in the Bible. The law is done away with, so we live in the Spirit. So now it's not about keeping certain days, doing certain things, but it's about the Spirit's work. But we also see that God commanded the Sabbath for a reason. He wanted to give us an example, practically what it means to rest. I want to share a story with you. There's a man named Eric Lydell. And this man was portrayed in the movie, The Chariots of Fire. This was a powerful movie about the Olympics. And Eric Lydell had a personal decision in his life. You see, he decided that he was never going to run on a Sunday. He was a Christian, and he believed that Christians are to fully keep the Sabbath. And he never wavered from it. In all of his training, he never practiced on a Sunday. Now, Eric Lydell was set to do a 100-meter relay race for, on the Olympics in 1924 on a Sunday. You see, but Eric Lydell was so strong in keeping the Sabbath because he believed in God. He based it off of a verse in um, Samuel that says, if you honor God, God will honor you. So the Olympic specialties, the Olympic authorities, and the Olympic head leaders tried to convince him to run on Sunday or else they would have to reschedule all of the Olympic event. But Eric Lydell wouldn't budge. He said, nope, I'm not running on Sunday. So it happened. They rescheduled him to run on a different day, but he couldn't run the 100 meter race anymore. They actually put him in the 400 meter, something he'd never trained in, never practiced in. And he was in the Olympics, people that practice this all the time. And he ran the race and he finished in 47.6 seconds, breaking the world record, which stood for 12 years. You see, the Bible says that blessed is the man who holds fast the Sabbath. Blessed is the man who keeps the Sabbath. Now, I don't know what you have to do with that story. I don't know what I can say besides that, but I can tell you from my own personal experience, God had me take different Sabbaths in my life. And it's important not to do it in a way of works, but how God leads you to Sabbath is something you really have to seek the Lord on personally. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was getting caught up in doing a lot of things for God. Now, my personality type, I actually took one of those little personality tests. I know they're kind of growing, you know. I'm a number three, which is an achiever. 
So part, I, I know that's not who I am because I'm, I'm what Christ says I am. So I don't, I'm, I'm very careful with, with psychology to not let it take any authority over God's word. But I do have a tendency and I know myself enough that I love to do things I love to do and achieve and accomplish and see results. That's what I love. That's what I really pride in and it's dangerous. And so for me, I was getting caught up and feeling exhausted, feeling like I was working so hard for the Lord and I was still feeling distant. So Holy Spirit inside of me started to speak to me and tell me to just start taking naps throughout the day. Uh, he had me take Sabbaths. Uh, once a week for a little bit and he was teaching me a lesson that I was to just go to bed throughout the day you know I wanted to read the Bible I wanted to do spiritual things but God said look just go to bed just sleep you know David says he gives to his beloved sleep and the Lord taught me just to rest throughout the middle of the day and it was something that I was so like against because of my disciplined personality I felt like I was like almost sinning and God taught me through that season that God really wants us to have rest. And he taught me so many lessons through that that I can't explain. But God really wants us to seek him on how he wants us to rest. Maybe it could be for one day a week. It doesn't matter the day, but it, it is a good principle. I encourage you to set a day, if you want to do it, to have one day. Maybe you can't do Saturday. Um, sometimes if you're in ministry, you definitely can't do Sunday. But have one day where you really just leave your time open to do something different. I've heard it best said if you are um, someone who likes to be in the books or studies at a desk, it's best to Sabbath while doing work with your hands. And if you're working with hands, sometimes it's best to Sabbath with books. But the Sabbath principle is number one, spiritual, and number two, practical. And I, and I wanted to take a moment to talk about that. Sorry if I went a little long, but I, I really wanted to establish that because we don't really talk about the Sabbath in today, but I believe it's very relevant and God will honor if you keep it, just like he honored that man breaking the world record. It says this, verse seven still talking about the mystery of the church. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer for all peoples. God says two times that my house, my church, is for prayer. I have a really cute dog. Her name's Bridget. She is the most adorable dog I've ever had. I love snuggling up with her. I love spending time with her, rubbing her belly. Sometimes she rolls over if I'm rubbing her and she just goes on her back and it's like, oh, Bridget, she's so cute. I just love her. My sisters love her. My mom really loves her. She like loves sleeping with my mom. I used to kind of actually be kind of crazy with my dog. I would like scare her for fun. I'd be like, yeah, and she'd like jump back and I was just like, hey, got him. But now I realized I grew out of that kind of childishness and now I really respect Bridget and I love spending time with her. And when I was younger, I used to, to just kind of trick her all the time. Like I'd fake throw the toy and she would run. But anyway, I loved Bridget and Bridget, my dog, she's fuzzy, golden, snuggly. She's really small. She's a King Cavalier poodle. But Bridget has different purposes in my life. You see, one of the things is that I love her. And you have to ask, why do people have dogs? I think one of the reasons is that you love your dog. You spend time with affection. Another reason people have dogs is to snuggle with them. You love snuggling with your dog. Another purpose of a dog is that it goes potty all the time. 
something that you have to get your mind around is you're gonna have to clean up some poop if you want a dog. Another thing you have to think of if you want a dog is that you have to groom it. You have to take it to the groomer and cut its hair and make sure it's well maintained. Another thing about a dog is that you have to train him to sit, to stand, to lie down. Sometimes you do the paw trick. But you see, the dog has many different purposes. But perhaps the main purpose that people have a dog is for comfort. They're very comforting to you when your life is stressed out. People like dogs for their comfort. And you see, dogs have different purposes, but they have many. But their main purpose is comfort. In the same way, God declares in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 56, that my house, my purpose for the church, the mystery of the church, my house shall be a, cause, uh, a house of prayer. He says it again, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. When Jesus went into the temple of Jerusalem, saw the money changers selling the things that weren't right, he walked in with a whip of cords. I think that's so cool. Jesus was probably just like ready to go. And he just knocked everything down, flipped the tables, told everyone to get out. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. So the church today, the, the power, the mystery of the church is that it's a place where people are to gather together and seek the Lord in prayer. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know us not. When the believers in Acts gathered together with prayer, they saw the day of Pentecost. It says they devoted themselves to prayer, to the breaking of the bread, and to the teaching of the apostles. And guess what? Souls were being added each day. And I think something that we have to come back to in Scripture that God's commanding for America today is to make the church a place of prayer, a place of seeking, a place of pressing into God and asking Him and pleading with Him. It says, for all peoples. It shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. We are to be gathering, holding hands, and praying as a church. Whew, but it starts with us personally. If we want to be a praying people in the church, we ought to be a praying people personally in our lives. So that's the mystery of the church. And it says, The Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather yet others to him besides those who are already gathered. Speaking of the branch analogy again, that God wants to gather other people into his branch, into his arms, into his relationship. Jesus, when he went into Jerusalem after riding on the donkey, he, he came over and he wept. It says, Jesus wept over Jerusalem saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have loved to gather you like a mother gathers her, her chicks into her arms. But you rejected me. And so Israel rejects Christ. Now verses 9 through 12 is talking about the rapture mystery, but it's also talking about the problems we have presently. And this is really an application to us today because we have circumstances that can seem like hell on earth. There are divorces, there is the pain of sin, there is the pain of regret, there is the pain of mothers with their children that have walked away completely from the faith, it seems like. There are people hooked on drugs and heroin. There is a reality of pain in this world. People, studies show, are getting more and more anxious than ever. 
And we're more connected than ever with social media, but it seems like we're less loving than ever in society. And there's a real pain and we're growing in certain areas, but the word of God has been taken out. So we're gonna see that God wants us to learn from this text that we can have hope in this world, a real hope. Verse nine says, all you beasts of the field come to devour, all you beasts in the forest. Now he's speaking of uh, right here, the beasts as Babylon, the Israelites right now were in exile in Babylon. They were taken out and they were captured by a foreign nation, by the King Nebuchadnezzar, who came in and took them and trapped them. So the beasts, referring to the foreigners, were devouring them. Verse 10 says, his watchmen are blind. Hosea 2 verse 1 tells us that the watchmen are referring to prophets. Hosea 2.1 says that the watchmen, you can mark that verse down and look at it, watchmen in the Bible are referring to prophets who are the ones who are watching. It's someone who sits in a high chair and looks over the people and looks and gets to see everything that's happening. And that's what the prophets are to be. They're supposed to be looking at the times and receiving messages from God. They're supposed to be people that spoke on the behalf of God back in the Old Testament. But it says that his watchmen, God's chosen prophets, his people are blind. And in Isaiah's day, they really were. Isaiah was one of the only prophets of his time. They are without knowledge. Wow. Another scripture says that people perish for a lack of knowledge. We are really to know God. They are all silent dogs that cannot bark, lying down and dreaming, loving to slumber. So these people that are supposed to be spiritual really have no power in them. They cannot bark because there is no Holy Spirit power in them. There's no God working through them. They have no confidence in the things of God and they're just sleeping the days away. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They are never enough. They have an appetite, these people, for the things of the world. Paul says in Philippians to look out in chapter three for enemies of the cross. And it describes the enemies as people. And it says their God is their belly. Meaning that they're, they just go for their appetites. They just live out, just indulging themselves in whatever they want to do. And that's what these people were doing. They had a mighty appetite for sin. They are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned their way, each one to his own gate, one and all. Come, they say, let me get wine. Let us fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow will be like this day, great beyond measure. Now, a recent article in wildlife.com, the same one where I got the slugs from, this was the top, so, so this one was number two on the craziest animal stories, but there was actually an even crazier one published in 2008 on wildlife.com. The title is this, it says American Airlines banned passengers from traveling with emotional support insects. I'll read that again because you might have missed it. Airlines banned passengers from traveling with emotional support insects. It says this in the article, insects aren't the only emotional support animals that the American An Airlines banned. Emotional support amphibians, hedgehogs, and ferrets are no longer permitted. Okay, what? Yes, it gets crazier. It says this, the move was a response to an 84% rise in urine feces and aggression related incidents on planes in the past 
two years. So the airlines, they actually had to ban people from coming in, people from coming in with insects as their emotional support. Some people were bringing in hedgehogs, it says, and amphibians, and they started to pee on the plane. Can you just imagine? I want you just to imagine a hedgehog peeing on a plane right now. Okay, that is crazy. That is just nuts. You see, the world's going crazy. It says they're actually, it's not just urine, but it's feces and aggression-related incidents. So that means that a ferret, it says one of the animals there was a ferret. So some idiot brought a ferret onto a plane and the ferret started like attacking someone. It was an aggression related incident. I mean, that's just crazy. So a ferret is like attacking someone on this plane. So now the AA says, look, we got to ban amphibians and insects. And I wonder what insects were, were coming on. Like someone's like, I got my emotional support wasp here. You know, he, he really helps me out. Like <laughs> what? That's just nuts. And, and God here is saying that all of the beasts of the field, all of the animals, the dogs that are having aggression-related incidents, you know what? They're not going to last. And it says this, verse 12, and it would say this also, that, that the people that are coming against you, that are aggression, having aggression on you, are, are tormenting you. Maybe it's your best friend, your closest friend you're having a problem with, and he's just not the same anymore. Or someone you look up to has fallen into a sin, and you look at them and you say, how can this be, God? And you see the people that you used to look to now become your enemies. The people you thought you were your friends, now that you're a Christian walking with the Lord, are looking at you and making fun of you. Or maybe it's the other way around. You are one of the dogs and you have a friend and you're putting him down when he's trying to really step it out in his faith. You see, and that's the situation that Israel was going around going along with and verse 12 tells us really why there was the problem this is talking about the rapture mystery it says come they say let me get wine let us fill ourselves with strong drink and tomorrow will be like this day great beyond measure you see this is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 talking about the end times verse 36 says concerning that day and hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven nor the son but the father only for as it were in the days of Noah there will be coming the son of man for as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be left in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that the master of the house, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the day, of the night, sorry, in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. You see, God's saying to us today, the people in Isaiah's day were saying, look, I'm just going to drink wine. Tomorrow's going to be another great day. I'm going to have all the fun in the world. And God says, stay awake because Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. And two people, they're going to be, to be doing their thing. One person's going to be grinding at the mill and then they're going to be taken away 
just raptured up, caught up in the heaven. First Thessalonians says that the dead in Christ will rise, then those who are alive will be caught up with Christ. And we know that the Bible teaches that the rapture will happen with the church. But for Israel, they will go through the tribulation. Let me make that very clear. Israel will not be raptured out. The nation Israel will go through the tribulation. The tribulation, this is a real key, will happen for three reasons. Number one, to wake up the nation of Israel. Number two, to shake up the heathen. I forget number three. But it's gonna, it, they're going to wake up the nation of Israel and they're going to shake up the heathen. The church will be caught up for seven years. Then the tribulation will take place. God will come back. It says he will be coming with the saints who were caught up in the heaven, come back, and then the battle will take place, then the millennial kingdom. So let us pray and let us make application to us today that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment and that these people were falling asleep. And it's to challenge us to not fall asleep in our faith. Then we also see that we are to be praying in church. So number one, stay awake with the Lord. Stay alert. Number two, be a man of prayer with the Lord. And then number three, pray about if the Lord wants you to keep a Sabbath day. Ask him to teach you more about him. So we're going to pray and close. Thank you, Father, for Isaiah chapter 56. Thank you for the things you've taught us. Lord, we pray that we would know you more, know your word more deeply. And I just thank you for everything you're teaching us. Convict us of sin. Show us your love. You're a great God. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and taking our place. Pray this in your name, amen.